guy that runs the puppet? Uh, Bergen. Okay, okay. So. I'm Candace. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, enough of that. We're not doing a very good job of that. Welcome. Happy New Year. Yeah. We're glad Happy you're year. here. This is going to be a great year for the Temecula Valley Historical Society. We're glad that each one of you is here. I'd like you, please, those who are able to stand, and we're going to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to remember why we're all here together. And there's the flag. Um, sorry, I should have gotten it out farther, but you can see it, so we'll take it as it is. All right? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may all sit down. And Lynn, do you have some announcements to make? Um, welcome. We have some new members here tonight. Uh, someone just joined this evening. Would that person please stand up? <laughs> okay. Peggy, and you're a friend of your friend of Barbara Lamb. Barbara Lamb. And, and many of the rest of us. And, yeah. and, and, and those of us who you are not a friend of yet, you will be if you keep hanging out with us. She's a great double peanut player. And we have some members here from the Menifee Hist Historical Society, correct? No. Marietta Valley. Marietta Valley? Oh, so where are you at Menifee? Yeah. Oh, okay. Menifee? Okay. Yeah. Am I correct? Okay. This is real interesting tonight, isn't it? Yeah, she's correct. Because, you know, we've, we've been, we haven't done anything for two months. We're back, and now we have to get back into the routine again. Right. I think I'm finished. Okay, Beth, do you have someone that you'd like to introduce? Beth Scott? <laughs> this is my friend, uh, Barbara Hayden. I've been a member for three years, and she loves history, and she's never been here in the building and is excited about that. <laughs> right. You <laughs> Do you have some announcements for us? I do. I have a tour coming up. Um, hello, everyone. Happy New hello. Year. 2020 is a good year for everyone. I have a tour scheduled on February uh, 18th. It's a walking tour. And uh, we're going to go to the, uh, the uh, Heritage Park Victorian Village. It's in Old Town, San Diego. There's seven restored homes, old uh, Victorian homes down there. And um, I've been trying to get this uh, going from, for quite a while now. I'm finally going to get a dose of lead tour down there. It's Victorian homes have been uh, restored from the 19th century. And then from then, it's about a block walk. We're going to go to the Whaley House. The Whaley House and the top 20 ghost uh, tour homes in the, in the United States, just <coughs> not California. It's number one. Hmm. And if we have over 12 people, the charge is only $4, normally 12 Wow. So we get a break there. And then after that, we will go and we'll have lunch like we normally do in Old Town. So it should be a fun day. Um, we're going to meet at 845 across the street uh, in the parking lot. Meet at 845, leaving at 9 o'clock. I have a uh, sign-up sheet here for those who would like to go. We just need your name and phone number, and I call everyone about couple of days beforehand to remind them they did sign up. So, um, any questions? Yes, Lynn? I put the price at $6. I thought it's even cheaper. Uh, the lady who was out of town for a while, she got back to me, and she said it was 4 if we have over 12. Yes. Okay, we'll start here. Okay. And here's a pin. Any questions? Any more questions? Ready. Thank you. What was that date again, Phil? Uh, Tuesday, February 18th. Yes. Is there a cost for the Victorian house? No. No, no cost. Any other questions? When do you want us to pay our money? When you get there, we'll pay at the gift shop. They have a gift shop there in the Whaley House. Any more questions? Yes, ma'am. Is it a bus? Oh, is it a bus? No, carpooling will be available. <laughs> Any more? Okay, thank you. Well, the main reason that we came tonight is, is to listen to Jeffrey. But before I introduce Jeffrey, I want to give you a preview of next month. And next month, it will also be worth your time to come, and it will be Bob Kent talking about Audie Murphy. Mm -hmm. So that will be a wonderful program also.
But tonight you're here to listen to Jeffrey Harmon and to see his wonderful presentation about Juan Murrieta. Now Jeffrey is a teacher and he is a historian. He is one of the best researchers among us and has collaborated on several books. And tonight he has his book and they're available for $15 per member and for, for anyone who's here tonight, and he will meet you at the back table after his presentation if you want to have one of his books. Jeffrey, thank you for this. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Oh, Let's you. welcome Jeffrey. Okay. Um, um, one of the reasons why I did Juan Marietta is because I am the president of the Marietta Valley Historical Society. Uh, we formed in April of 2016, and the Temecula Valley Historical Society was kind of our parent historical society that helped us launch. And uh, we're very grateful for all your support. Uh, last year in April, we opened Marietta's first museum. Um, if you haven't uh, had a chance to come visit us, uh, please do. And also, um, at least once a month, I do a, two different walking tours of Marietta. One for the downtown um, Washington Avenue area, and the other one called Marietta 1885, which uh, focuses on the original town site, and there are no more buildings left, so we have to use pictures in our imagination as we walk around a 10-acre site. So if you're interested in any of those tours, uh, please be watching our Facebook page, or you can send us an email if you want a private tour. All right. Juan Marietta is kind of interesting because we've seen a lot of books written about Juan Marietta, and we've heard a lot of tales about Juan Marietta, and some of them are little tall tales. Um, and the other thing that's really interesting about him is that um, everything that's written about him is kind of spread out through a lot of different books. So you have to look at a bunch of books to bring it all together to look at um, this wonderful man. Uh, Juan Marietta was a Spaniard, a shepherd, a landowner, a family man, a botanist, and a lawman. And, right. uh, Juan Marietta was born October 5th, 1846 in uh, Bilbao, uh, Spain. Uh, this was known as the Bosque region, which was located around the western end of the Pyrenees Mountains on uh, the coast of the Bay of Biscay. Uh, starting part of north central Spain and southwestern uh, France. Uh, when he was born, he was born just a few years after the first uh, Carlos War, and this was a seven year uh, Spanish Civil War. Uh, the Bosque people were traditionalists and supported Carlos V for the throne. The opposition was the Cristinos, who were liberals and supported the Queen Regent Maria Cristina and her infant daughter Isabella II. So Juan grew up in a time of political unrest and the threat of war. By 1860, his brother Ezekiel Murrieta had traveled to California and had established himself in Merced County, and he was raising cattle. Juan Murrieta left Spain at the age of 17, and according to his 1930 interview, he was in company with two brothers one of whom settled in Brazil and the other in Peru. In making his way to California, Marietta stated that he touched at England, then sailed to the island of St. Thomas, then to uh, Valparaiso. He then uh, crossed the Isthmus of Panama and then sailed north to San Francisco. His brothers later made their way to California and the three took up property in the vicinity of Merced and then later San Luis Obispo. And I love, I had one person say, you know, isn't it amazing? No matter how big the world is, they were still able to find them in the middle of Merced or in California. <laughs> so, yeah. And um, by uh, 1870, Juan and Ezekiel are now living in Merced uh, County. And this time, Juan Arrieta was uh, sheep herding. So, um, in the according to the 1870 census, Juan's uh, real estate value was $3,000, and his personal estate valued at $7,500. Um, the American Civil War had destroyed uh, the cotton industry in the South, so the demand for wool had caused prices to rise. 
So the Myriad of Brothers had sold off their cattle and began raising sheep. <clears throat> then along comes this gentleman here, Jose Gonzalez. He was also a man from the Basque region of Spain, and he knew the Marietta brothers. He had arrived in San Francisco in the early 1870s. He met with uh, the brothers and told them of an investment opportunity. Ezekiel and Juan Marietta, along with Domingo Pujol and Francisco Sanforo, uh, purchased the Rancho Pava and the Rancho Temecula on July 17, 1873. It was a total of 51,370 acres at a cost of about a dollar per acre. If they only knew what it would be like today. Um, Jose Gonzalez was the ranch accountant and managed the business affairs. He married uh, Grace Street on March 17, 1874 here at the Temecula Ranch. And they have two children, Ormiston and Isabel and his adobe is still standing today. I'm sure he'd be really proud to know Molly Mae was in his house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now here's where one of those tall tales come along. Um, Juan Marietta uh, brought about 7,000 sheep into the valley to graze and um, he brought him in from San Luis Obispo down here. And this is according to a newspaper account of that time period. However, a lot of us historians like to elaborate the numbers. Um, some historians have said it was 5,000, some said 10,000, and some said there's not enough zeros, let's call it 100,000 sheep. <laughs> so they said, yeah, we're gonna have 100,000 sheep coming into Temecula. Um, the problem here is that uh, I don't believe there was enough land, water, or labor um, to support 100,000 sheep. Um, according to a 1930 interview, Juan Muria stated that from San Luis Obispo Ranch, he drove sheep in bands of 1,500 to the Temecula country where good ranges were available at that time. So if he's driving on that 1,500 um, per sheep, then that means he made at least four trips. To, from San Luis Obispo to Temecula. So if you can imagine him trying to drive 100,000 sheep, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, the other thing that historians love telling us is that Juan Marietta dipped his sheep in the Marietta Hot Springs. And um, I don't remember the last time I dipped a sheep. <laughs> I'm a pretty boy, I have no idea why I am dipping a sheep. And I don't know why we're dipping them in the Marietta Hot Springs. Um, sounds kind of interesting to me. Uh, we do know that they were doing it to clean the wool, but why the hot springs? You know? uh, why not the Temecula Creek right behind us? Why the hot springs? Um, so I had to go and figure out what in the world is sheep dipping. I have absolutely know what sheep dipping is. I mean, the closest I ever got to a sheep is probably a children's petting zoo. That's about as close as I get to a sheep. So in the book, uh, The Domestic Sheep, Its Culture and General Management by Henry Stewart, published in 1900, it states that sheep dipping was done to clean the wool before the sheep were sheared. Uh, during the season of growth, the wool becomes dusty, oily, and full of excessive perspiration. That doesn't sound like Mary's little lamb to me. <laughs> it sounds really gross and disgusting. Um, these impurities added to the weight of the fleece and reduced its general value to the buyer who usually deducts one third from the current prices as compensation for these impurities. Okay, so now I'm getting this idea of why I'm dipping a sheep. I want to get the most money out of my wool as I possibly can. So here is kind of a diagram of how we dip a sheep. I don't know, for me, I always thought that you just strap them on a chair and dump them or something. I, I didn't know what they were talking about when you're dipping a sheep. Uh, sheep are dipped in a trough. Um, the water had to be pure and the bed needed to be free from mud and sand. For a small flock, a trough 12 feet long, 8 inches wide at the bottom and 30 inches at the top with sufficient depth to cover the sheep except its head. We don't want to drown it. Which is held up as it's passed through the trough the body be, being submerged sufficiently to enable the assistants to thoroughly wash the animal and reach every part of the skin. Whew. That sounds like a lot. Mm -hmm. 
7,000 sheep, I can see that. Washing 100,000 sheep, mm, no, I'm not doing that. All right, so the dipping the liquid is kept at a temperature over 100 degrees by the natural hot springs. So what this means is that if you didn't have the hot springs, you would have to have two boilers, one on each side of the trough to warm up the water. That's a lot of work. And so the reason he's dipping them in the myriad of hot springs is they're already hot, so he doesn't need the boilers. Um, and it's nice, beautiful, uh, pure water that's coming out. Uh, for a small, uh, let's see, the dipping liquid is kept at a temperature of, yeah, okay, the sheep then are kept in a pen allowing the excess liquid to drip off and drain back to the dripping trough. So they're coming in, they're going through the um, trough, and then on the other side, they're now dripping uh, wet and dripping off the water, and all that water is kind of sloping back into the trough. The sheep are then um, led into the lot where the fleece may dry. Once the fleet was cleaned, the sheep were sheared. The wool was then transported to San Diego and loaded onto ships. On average, the annual price received for the wool was about $15,000. So you can imagine being in the 1870s, they're doing pretty well for themselves. So again, 100,000 sheep, that's kind of a little too many zeros for me. I don't want to be watching that many sheep. <laughs> All right, uh, Juan Marietta married Adele Golsch uh, in um, February 13, 1876. Uh, we believe that he was probably married here at the Lewis uh, Wolf store. Uh, Lewis Wolf was Justice of the Peace at the time, and his name is signed there on the marriage certificate. <clears throat> the um, Adele Golsch was uh, born in Vienna, Austria in 1857. She was the daughter of Alfred and Joseph uh, Golsch, Joseph Golsch. And um, the Golsch family had immigrated to America in 1868. They had settled in Paula, California. Uh, their name was abbreviated from their Polish name, Gola Zeski. So they went from Gola Eski to Golsh. Now here's another tall tale related to Juan Marietta, and that is um, the Golsh family was somehow related to the Habsburg family, the royal Habsburgs in Europe. Um, the family lore is this. The Afro-Prussian conflict caused the Golsch family to flee Europe. It was a Prussian statesman, Prince Otto von uh, Bismarck's first step towards annexing of the divided German states that surrounded his country. Needless to say, the rulers in most of the states didn't want to give up their kingdoms, and the royal Habsburg family was no different. One of the Habsburgs, um, they said it was Victor Emil Golsch, was forced to leave the country by Bismarck and his army. Emperor Maximilian of Mexico, he was a member of the Habsburg family, he offered the young man and his family an estate in Mexico. And so the Golsch family set sail for the New World. While they were crossing the ocean, however, Maximilian was executed by the Mexican people. I don't think I want to land in Mexico now. So the Golsch family decided um, against landing in Mexico and they continued on to California. Uh, Victor Golsch and his wife and children traveled from California coast to Paula where they built a home and settled. That sounds like a wonderful tale. Is it true? I don't know, it's written in a lot of local historians uh, books. Uh, this is Professor Inga Hoppler of Austria. She has visited um, here at the center a couple of times. Um, she uh, has done extensive research on the Golsch family. She travels to Southern California almost once a year to research the California Golsch family and their descendants. Uh, Professor Hoppler has found no evidence linking the Golsch family to the Habsburg line, but her search continues. So Juan and Adele um, lived in this adobe structure. Uh, the Marietta home was located near the present day intersection of Winchester Road and Jefferson Avenue near the Santa Gratuitous Creek. We usually use uh, Flippy's Pizza Restaurant as kind of our landmark right around there about their parking lot. 
Uh, Juan and Adele Marietta had three children, Alfred, Henry, and Adele. Adele had married, I uh, love this fact about it, Adele married Sherman Otis Hupton Jr. Um, his mother, uh, Mary Martha Donner, was a survivor of the Donner Party. So she kind of married into some uh, interesting California history there. Dinner must have been interesting. Oh, you know, you just have a holiday, people are always complaining about having dinner with their relatives. And now you're sitting down having dinner with someone that survived the Donner Party. I don't know. What's on the menu, Mom? Mm -hmm. All right. While uh, Marietta's family lived in the valley, there were roving bands of marauders from Sonora, Mexico, that made their way from Mexico en route to the Pueblo of Los Angeles. Uh, these bands numbered from 15 to 20, all armed with long knives, much like machetes. Uh, they wore sandals and were clad in pants and shirts of white cotton. They took what food they needed from the ranches through which they passed. Juan Marietta was shrewd by anticipating the marauders' needs. Upon learning that a band was approaching, he would kill three or four sheep and hang up their carcasses a distance from the ranch house. And the band would cut off what meat they wanted and made no further trouble for the rancher. However, an Englishman who sought to prevent the practice on the part of the marauders promptly paid for his opposition with his life. <laughs> Uh, when Juan Marietta settled in the valley, he had notified the local uh, Luceno, um, the local Native Americans here at their village here in Temecula, that he now owned the land. But he had no intention of removing the Indians from the land. He employed the Indians as sheep shearers, shepherds, and farmhands. Um, Juan Marietta was kind of a latecomer uh, from Spain. Um, the Spanish Empire was not interested in destroying the native uh, people they encountered during their conquest of the New World. Uh, the natives were seen as future citizens of the Spanish Empire. If a native village was located on a Spanish land grant, the landowner had to leave the village alone. So on February 2nd, 1848, America signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago and ending the Mexican-American War. In the treaty, the Americans agreed to abide by Spanish law, which means that if there was an Indian village on a Spanish land grant, it had to be left alone. Um, on August 1st, 1849, the California Constitution was drafted in Colton Hall in Monterey, California. The Constitution was written in both Spanish and English. Americans told the Spanish dons that they would uphold the Spanish land laws. So again, they're promising, hey, you know, the Indians will stay on their village on the land grants. And then on September 18, 1851, the Treaty of Temecula was signed uh, right across the creek here, setting land aside for the California native population. And the Senate, however, never ratified that treaty, and thus the native people had no land to call their own. So all the way up until about 1850, the Indians were basically being left alone. But again, because Juan Marietta was a latecomer, he's not really going to be following the rules of um, the old Spanish land laws. So kind of the dark side of Juan Marietta is by September of 1875, Chief Oliverio, uh, who resided in Paula, went to Los Angeles to file a complaint against Juan Marietta. Uh, there were no fences to keep the sheep out of the Indians' uh, gardens and crops. And one day an Indian got upset and confronted a ranch hand, and the ranch hand reported the incident to his boss, Juan Marietta. Uh, Juan decided it was time to remove the Indians from his land. He gave the people an opportunity to lease the land from him for 40 days until their crops were harvested. Uh, seven families accepted his offer. Those that did not take the offer were given 11 days to gather their belongings and move off um, the rancho. On September 20th, 1875, San Diego Sheriff Hunsaker and a posse along with Juan Marietta and Francisco Sanjuro began evicting the Indians from their village. 
The eviction was completed on September 23rd. According to one report, there were 52 heads of household representing over 200 people. Uh, the Pachango website states the posse left, uh, led by Sheriff Hunsinger, who was paid $300 for the job, included the owners of the ranch, as well as local landowners, Lewis Wolf and Jose Gonzalez. The men drove wagons to the Indians home and loaded their belongings in them. The Indians did not fight back because the posse members told them that anyone who resisted would be shot. The Temecula people protested by sitting down and refusing to move any of their belongings. Once the wagons were full, the people were forced to leave the village following behind the wagons. They had to abandon their crops and most of their livestock. The posse shouted insults and threw stones to get them to move along. Once they were beyond the borders of the rancho, a hike of about three miles, the posse members emptied the wagons onto the ground. They were not careful and they broke many of the people's belongings, including pots that contained food. The evictees salvaged what they could and looked for a new place to go. The Temecula Indians found temporary refuge at the John McGee store at the foot of the Temecula grade. Uh, John McGee's wife was a Temecula Indian woman. And personally, I think it was probably one of the most porous uh, business decisions Juan Murrieta made in his life. Last thing you want to do is upset your workforce. They were the ones that were basically taking care of all his sheep, and now he has kicked them out of their homes. Not a good way to be favored um, as a boss. And um, surprisingly, uh, not surprisingly, uh, his business basically kind of ended uh, within a year. Personally, I think it would have been a better decision just to build a fence around the village. Batteries went out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. What is it? A D? Or I mean a long foot. The night bolt. Let me see. Creek golf courses, yes. it would be right there. Am I back on? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. As a teacher, we are always taught to expect the unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Helen Hunt Jackson, uh, a Native American activist, visited Temecula and witnessed the Lusania's horrible living conditions. Her reports helped to convince Congress to set land aside for the people. Uh, the Pachanga Reservation was established on June 27, 1882. And Ms. Jackson also wrote the novel Ramona based on the hardship of the Lusania. So a year later, after um, evicting the um, Temecula Indians, uh, the partnership dissolved. Uh, Domingo Pujol bought out his partner's interest in the two ranchos. He then sold to Juan Marietta 1,500 acres of the northern half of the Temecula Rancho. A year later, uh, Juan Marietta sold his land holdings uh, to his brother Ezekiel, who had returned to Spain. Uh, Domingo Pujol also returned to Spain where he married a young woman named Mercedes. Uh, Domingo uh, died in, in Spain and Mercedes Pujol then inherited um, the Temecula land. Later, uh, Mercedes Pujol donated 18 acres of the southern portion of the Temecula Rancho to the California Southern Railroad Company. Uh, the land was used to relocate the town of Temecula next to the railroad tracks. And then on April 26, 1882, 
the Murrieta brothers granted to the railroad a right-of-way across the northern half of the Temecula Rancho. In 1883, Juan Marietta was appointed postmaster of the Pujol Post Office. Uh, this was next to the Southern Immigrant Trail. Uh, the Armstrong Garden Center in Temecula is currently located there. Uh, the post office was only open a few months and then closed, probably because of its distance from the railroad. Juan Marietta tried to establish a town next to the railroad tracks in 1884. The name of his town was Murrietaville, and he wasn't very successful with forming his town, so a few months later, he sold 14,500 acres to this gentleman here, Charles Clark Stevenson of Carson City, Nevada. Uh, Stevenson had made his fortune in the Comstock Lode, and he was looking for land to invest in. <coughs> So Stevenson organized the Temecula Land and Water Company and established a town along the railroad. The town was named Marietta in honor of Juan Marietta. Stevenson uh, bought up the remaining Pujo land in the southern portion of the Temecula Rancho and formed the Temecula Fruit Company. That one wasn't very successful. You only see it a couple of times in the paper and it disappears. Um, he also purchased the Papa Rancho, uh, which is where we are today, and formed uh, the Papa Land and Water Companies. And then two years later, Stevenson was elected the fifth governor of Nevada. However, he died in office of typhoid fever in 1890. The town of Marietta consisted of 14,500 acres, the Marietta Post Office um, opened on July 28, 1885, and the train depot was built in 1887. And the original town site was Washington to Hayes to Ivy to Calmia. Nice little rectangle there. And the diagonal line going across the map there would be the railroad going right across the town site. So here's what all of a sudden, Marietta starts looking like, now that Juan Marietta has sold um, this property and the town starts being built. Um, the first post office in Marietta was established in this building in Dr. Horace Alasley's drugstore. Uh, there was a small slot in the front door where mail could be dropped off. This was also the last store to be um, demolished in the original town site. Uh, this was used all the way up until the 1950s. Um, it was used by the grain elevator as an office and a granary. The Marietta train depot was located at the corner of B Street and present-day New Clay Avenue. Uh, the original meal stop was in Fallbrook, but in 1886, the railroad discontinued the meal stop at Fallbrook and established it at Marietta. The reason why is that a rail line between Marietta and San Jacinto had been proposed. Uh, Marietta's train depot was large in anticipation that Marietta would become a rail hub. Um, the Marietta-San Jacinto rail line, of course, never happened. But if you want to learn more about this, please attend our May presentation at the Marietta Public Library. Steve Lex will be giving that talk. Thank you, Steve, for coming down today. In 1885, uh, the president of the Temecula Land and Water Company was M.L. Wilkes, and he built a hotel, not this elaborate one that we see right here, but it was just kind of a two-story rectangular building. Uh, basically, you're going to come out here and looking at land, so you need a place to stay while you're looking around, and then you can get back on the train the next day. Um, he sold it to C.H. Benton in 1886, and because Marietta became a meal stop, um, an addition was built to the original um, hotel. A fountain was built in the front yard and the hotel was named the Fountain House Hotel. Probably one of the prettiest buildings in the um, downtown area. The new addition provided a kitchen and a dining room for the, training pa the train passengers. The train was stopped in Marietta. The passengers would disembark and walk over the railroad tracks and enter the hotel. A hot meal was served and then the passengers would reboard the train and continue on their journey. 
The Colrick brothers had established the first general store in Marietta. It was called the Pioneer Store. They sold the store in June of 1895 to Ainsworth and Fellis, who operated the store for nine years. John M. Richardson uh, established a hardware store and feed mill on April 22, 1886. Uh, the Marietta Post Office was located in the store from 1894 until 1898. And then Benjamin Tarwater established a Tarwater cash store on July 4, 1891 on uh, the corner oh, sorry there it is on the corner of first avenue and b street and dr charles e lawrence arrived in marietta on november 11th 1885 he was a surgeon and physician for the railroad and a surgeon for the independent order of foresters he established a drugstore on third avenue in 1886. then the marietta grammar school was built in 1885 and the school bell rang for the first time on October 28, 1885. I just can't imagine for what it would have been like for Juan Marietta. You're sitting there raising sheep on just open grasslands, and then the next year there's a town that's just popping up. The Marietta Methodist Episcopal Church uh, was completed in 1887. The uh, church was located on A Street and Washington Avenue. Sadly, it was destroyed by an arsonist in 1963. And then the Holiness Church was organized in 1886. It was destroyed by a fire of unknown origins in January of 1921. The church was rebuilt later that year. So this was Murrieta in 1886. This is the town that was named in honor of Juan Murrieta. Notice how many trees are growing in the valley at this time. So where did they get all the wood to build all these buildings? The closest sawmill was San Jacinto, which might well have been on the other side of the world. So. They pretty much had to bring everything in by the train. So we can recognize all the buildings, right? No. Okay, let's get a little bit closer. There we go. All right. Um, again, so this is uh, Marietta, about 1886. And if you want to know what we're looking at here, there you go. So again, the yellow line showing you where the railroad was going right through the town. Uh, you can see where the fountain house is. I love this photograph because um, you can actually see the original um, hotel that M.L. Wilkes built, which is the two-story rectangle building in the back. And then you can see the um, annex of the fountain house in the front of it. You can see where the train depot was and the school, uh, Richardson's hardware store and Lawrence's drug store. Uh, what you don't see in there is the Methodist Church, and that's why I, I deem this probably right around 1886, because the church isn't there yet. But again, at one point it was all just grassland, and then the next year this little town pops up, and it's named after Juan Marietta. Um, one of the things that Juan Marietta did was he did not sell around a thousand acres surrounding his own farm. Um, that became known as the Marietta Reservation. In 1885, Ezekiel deeded the land to Juan Marietta. And then in 1887, Juan leased the Marietta farm to Albert Hutchinson and William Brown. Uh, Hutchinson and Brown established the first large-scale dairy farm in southwest Riverside County. Uh, this photo may have been taken on the Marietta Reservation. So the question is, where is the Marietta Reservation? Uh, so here is what it looks like. This was um, located today, the Marietta Reservation today is located in the city of Temecula. Uh, the northern border is um, Cherry Street and the southern border was Apricot Street. Um, Apricot Street today is known as Overland Drive in Temecula. Uh, the line that you see bisecting uh, the Marietta Reservation 
was the railroad going right across there. So here is a modern view of the Marietta Reservation. You think Juan Marietta would have been happy to see his beautiful little farm looking like that today? Mm -hmm. Um, here is uh, the locations of some of the historic home sites. Uh, number one on there, it's kind of small to see from the back, but number one is where uh, Juan Marietta's adobe may have been. Number two is where Jose Gonzalez's adobe is located today. Um, this adobe has been uh, restored and is located in the middle of the adobe plaza in Temecula. And then number three is the home site of Eli E. Barnett uh, home, which you can see is kind of kitty corner from Juan Maria's place there. In 1886, Juan Marietta and his family moved to Los Angeles. And here's the family uh, settling in, in Los Angeles. Juan, Adele, and their three children. Now, another misconception we have about Juan Marietta, uh, we read about this uh, in some of the books, that um, he was part of the Sheriff's Department in Los Angeles, and he had badge number one of the Deputy Sheriff of Los Angeles. Um, every time I've heard that, I've always kind of scratched my head and like tried to figure this one out. Los Angeles County was formed in 1850, and you mean to tell me they didn't have a deputy sheriff until 1886? Are we following you here? I mean, it sounds like Los Angeles was a very law-abiding town if you didn't need a deputy sheriff. So I'm like going, okay, there's a problem here. What is this badge number one that they're talking about? Well, what it was is that in 1887, Juan Marietta was sworn in as the first Chief Deputy of the Civil Division of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office. Okay, and so, okay, what is the Civil Division? Civil Division was organized um, in 1886, and Juan Marietta had moved to Los Angeles at that time, and he was then sworn in as their first Deputy of the Civil Division of Los Angeles Sheriff's Office. So it's kind of interesting, I'm even guilty of this, you know, I don't want to write that whole full title on there, so I'm just going to put down that he got badge number one as a deputy sheriff. Okay, see that where the problem is here? So he had remained in office until he retired in 1927. But when you're calling him a deputy sheriff, um, that is giving me kind of this idea that maybe he was some kind of gunslinging lawman, kicking down doors and arresting criminals. And I even looked in the newspapers trying to find him, like doing some great heroic deed out there. Never found anything, I couldn't figure out why. Um, but again, he was working for the civil division of the sheriff's office. So I had to look at this up and go, what is this? The civil division's uh, purpose and function was basically to serve papers of eviction, income executions, executions and family court matters. The duties do not sound as glamorous as deputy sheriff. It's basically just handing out papers, legal papers. So this idea that he was a gunslinger, no, no. So he was just doing all the grunt work that the regular sheriff didn't want to be doing, basically. He's doing all the paperwork. Juan Marietta was also a botanist. It is believed that the streets of Marietta running east to west were given botanical names in his honor. So the streets are named in alphabetical order. Apricot, which is here in Temecula now, it's Overland Drive. Banana Street, which is Winchester. I wish it was still Banana Street because that would explain the mall to me. You know? yeah, this okay, then we got the Cherry and Date, Elm, Fig, Guava, Hawthorn, Ivy, <coughs> Juniper, Calmia, Lemon, Magnolia, and Nutmeg. In 1892, Juan Murrieta planted the first avocado trees in California at his Los Angeles home. And so the California Avocado Association 
credits Juan Marietta for establishing the avocado industry here in California. <clears throat> On December 25th, 1899, a 6.5 earthquake um, struck San Jacinto. And during this earthquake, one wall of the Marietta adobe collapsed. It is believed um, after the earthquake, the Marietta adobe was demolished rather than repaired. Then in 1904, the Marietta res Reservation was sold to Eli E. Barnett. Uh, he had married Isabel Gonzalez, uh, the daughter of Jose Gonzalez. Uh, Barnett built this home on the north side of the Santa Cruz Creek. Juan Marietta died August 25th, 1936 in Los Angeles and was buried in the Calvary Cemetery um, there in Los Angeles. So today, the city of Marietta is named in honor of Juan Marietta. He was a young teenage Spaniard who came to California and became a successful landowner and businessman. Though large flocks of sheep no longer freely graze in the valley, the large avocado groves that extend from Duluth to Escondido remind us of our founder, Juan Marietta. This concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? One in the back. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, the railroad ran through town in 1886. Where did it start? Where did it end? Good question. So the question is, where did the railroad begin and end? The railroad uh, began in National City, just south of San Diego. It went right along the coastline until it got to um, just a little bit north of Oceanside and then went east through the Santa Margarita uh, Canyon here into Temecula and then went north and then uh, then it veered east again to Paris and then from Paris it went north all the way up into uh, Barstow and then it connected to the um, cross-country rail from there. Yes? Um, the railroad went all the way up to what we know as Elsinore Junction. Um, Elsinore Junction would be where McDonald's is today. And then Railroad Canyon is named for the railroad that went through and uh, followed the San Jacinto River going north um, right across Canyon Lake up into uh, Paris from there. So, and then the spur route that you're talking about would have been when the Albert Hill um, clay operations began and they built a spur route coming out of Elsinore Junction into the downtown um, Lake Elsinore area where Spring Street is, and then it followed up Collier Avenue up to uh, Albert Hill. And then uh, because of all the washouts in Railroad Canyon, um, that was abandoned, and then they just extended Albert Hill all the way to Corona. And then the railroad ran from Elsinore to Corona all the way up until um, the early 1980s, and then closed. But the railroad here in southwest Riverside County uh, was abandoned um, south of Elsinore Junction in 1935. Yes? Was that railroad a standard uh, four, four feet, eight and a half inches, or was it a narrow gauge? Um, I would have to consult my railroad guide. <laughs> Somebody told me it was a narrow gauge when um, it went through the canyon. Bob, do you? No, it was standard gauge. It was standard gauge? Standard gauge. They ran, they ran the trains all the way. Good question. Thank you. Yes. So the adobe you mentioned that is still standing. Um, where is that, and what's it what's it used for? So um, that was a photo we saw earlier with Molly made on it. Um, right across the street from In and Out Burger on Jefferson Avenue is the Adobe Plaza. And it's smack dab in the middle of the Adobe Plaza. You'll see the office for Molly Maid, and that office is Juan Marietta's Adobe. And there is a historic plaque on uh, the building there today. It was uh, by the 1980s, the Adobe was almost ready to be demolished, and then um, a group saved it and restored it. And Governor Pete Wilson came out and dedicated it um, for the restoration. Yeah. No, I was just saying, it wasn't, you mean the Gonzales Adobe? What's that? It's the, it's the Gonzales Adobe. Yeah, the Gonzales Adobe, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
Any other questions? Yes, one more. I think uh, you mentioned about the first schoolhouse. Is that maybe still standing today? Okay, so the Marietta Grammar School, um, basically what happened was by 1900, uh, the population had grown in Marietta. We added an addition. And then uh, by uh, 1919, um, the population was even larger and we needed a new school. So in uh, the second half of 1919, the 1885 building was um, torn down and a new grammar school was built on the site. Um, and that one was dedicated in 1920. And that one was the Marietta Grammar School from 1920 all the way up until 1956. 1956, um, it was deemed uh, not um, compliant with the current uh, building code standards. So they closed it and they built the third school, which is the Marriott Elementary School that's standing today on Adams and Calmia. And then the 1920 uh, grammar school went into private hands in the 1960s. And then the um, early 1980s, it was gutted by fire and is in ruins today on 2nd Avenue and owned by the city of Marietta. And they don't know what they're going to do with it. Jeffrey, will you just tell everybody a little bit about the museum, the hours you can go when your historical society has your meetings? Just give us a little Absolutely. Update. Thank you. Um, the Marietta Museum is located um, at 41810 Juniper Street uh, in Hunt Memorial Park, directly across the street from Fire Station 1 in Marietta. Um, the, currently, the museum is open on Thursdays from 1 to 4. Um, but if you want to visit it on another day, please give us a call and let us know, and we can make arrangements to open it up for you. Um, Especially like uh, we had a couple that had friends from Finland that recently visited Marietta and they wanted to show them the museum. And so, absolutely, people from Finland want to come see our museum. <laughs> we'll open it up for you. Um, so, yes. Um, and the museum is a little under 900 square feet, but we have squeezed as much as we could possibly get into it. And um, we do, uh, we've partnered with the Marietta Public Library and we do presentations every other uh, month. Uh, this month in January, we had our presentation, uh, the first performance of E. Hale Kern uh, performed uh, from the, uh, what's the name, Noble Men, uh, Women and Men uh, group here from Temecula. And uh, I believe March, should we do? Yeah, March, should we here. And then our next performance will be in March. We will have Jerry Nichols. Uh, be talking about um, uh, O.T. Hackett, the stagecoach driver. And um, yeah, what else did you ask? Did that was good. That was good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and I do walking tours um, once a month um, at Marietta to tell people about the history. I just did uh, two of them this weekend. And if you want a private tour, let me know, and we'll hook you up. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much again. I appreciate it.